Here we go. All ones. Thanks for sliding in, Chummers, as now is the time for all of us who run in the shadows to learn about the sixth world and how it became what it is today. Today's topics are among the biggest events that helped shape the current geopolitical state of North America today. We are talking about the formation of the Native American nations, otherwise known as the NAN. In this discussion, we'll be doing a deep dive into how this coalition of nation states formed and set the stage for the fall of so many mighty nations of the old world and the events that led up to the rise of the modern megacorps. But before we get into the history of the NAN itself, we must cover a few other topics that led up to its formation, like how corporate exterritoriality led up to the resource rush, the awakening, and the great ghost dance war itself. This is a tale of how the great powers of the fifth world were led to ruin by corrupt men guided by the avarice desires of the megacorporations who sought to prey upon those they thought were weak, and how in the end, they were terribly wrong. This tale begins in 2002, a year after the Shiawase decision came down. At this time, many of the rich and powerful, such as Old Nick of General Motors, began consolidating their business assets. With the goal of attaining extraterritoriality, this led to the formation of the early megacorporations. These massively wealthy for-profit entities were now above the law and backed up by military might thanks to the Seertech decision. With this newfound power, these early megacorporations looked hungrily at the untapped natural resources of the politically weakened governments of North America with avarice desire. These megacorporations quickly began to pressure and outright buying politicians who they tasked with abusing eminent domain laws in a scheme dubbed the resource rush by the media. This scheme involved the U.S. and Canadian governments seizing land and then leasing it to the megacorporations, most notably United Oil. This meant due to the new extraterritoriality laws, the land and its resources belonged to the megacorporations in all but name. Much of this land seized was either public land or that belonging to Native Americans. As more and more land was seized for corporate exploitation, the more public discontent rose over these acts of legal abuse, causing a notable rise in activist groups opposing the corporate land grab despite the threat of corporal militaries which made such activities very dangerous. Among these groups was the Sovereign American Indian Movement or SAME which had its roots in the American Indian Movement of the 20th century. SAME set out to reclaim their stolen lands using much of the same tactics as their predecessor. Among these tactics was blockading important highways that ran through native owned lands, a successful tactic that was used by Amerindians of Canada in the 1990s. At first, this tactic seemed to work as public opinion was against the resource rush, which forced the North American governments to the negotiation table. But in the end, the promises of these governments failed to appear, leading to a second wave of blockades. These new blockades received mixed reviews by the public as corporate media was busy putting out propaganda, calling these blockades acts of ecotage, even comparing them to the Terra First attack on the Shiawase reactor. This caused public opinion to quickly explode against the blockades. With the propaganda war won, the North American governments quickly moved in with the support of corporate security forces to remove the blockades by force. Besides one blockade controlled by the Sioux, the attacks on the blockades resulted in few casualties on either side. Though the second wave of blockades failed, it did send a message to same, and that message was, they were fighting a now escalated war, and from here on out their tactics needed to change. In 2009, United Oil had announced they had acquired the rights to exploit the petrochemical resources of one quarter of federal parkland and one tenth of native lands which were confiscated by the government. Same was quick to respond immediately and decisively. A team from SAME made up of former U.S. Special Forces with the aid of Silo Insider Major John Redborn, a Dakota Sioux, to control the Shiloh Watch Facility in Montana. This facility included 16 Lone Eagle MIRV-capable nuclear missiles and their launch codes which were presumably acquired by Major Redborn. SAME was quick to claim responsibility and demand the return of all stolen land during the resource rush or they would launch the missiles. After 10 days of tense negotiation, SAME discovered it was all just a ploy to buy time as a U.S. emergency response team attacked. Meanwhile at the White House, as the then U.S. President Jesse Garrity received reports that all SAME operatives were dead, he also received a report from NORAD that a single Lone Eagle missile launched from the Shiloh facility and was headed towards the Russian Republic. The U.S. was quick to warn the Russians of the isolated incident so they could prepare. Though the Russians were skeptical it was not a ploy, they seemingly did nothing to retaliate. And while the public was left in the dark, the rest of the world cried, ranted, and prayed. A short time later, Russian President Nikolai Chanko called the White House to notify him that the missiles had been stopped. 
To this day, no one knows how the missiles were stopped. They seemingly vanished in thin air, as no space and seismic sensor had confirmed their explosion. After the world learned of the Lone Eagle crisis, the public needed someone to blame, and the corporate propagandists were happy to deflect from the outrage of the resource rush by making same public enemy number one and by proxy all Native Americans, as news channels fed the public the tales of the megacorps wanted them to see. Unhappy with the pace of land acquisition, United Oil and other megacorporations pressured the U.S. Congress in passing the Re-Education and Relocation Act of 2010, with the Canadian Parliament passing the Nepian Act soon after. These laws authorized anyone with any connection to SAME to be placed in re-education facilities. These so-called facilities were little more than concentration camps for Amerindians. The public backlash towards Native Americans caused by corporate propaganda gave law enforcement and corporate agencies the ability to to abuse the laws, and soon anyone with any native background was forced into the camps. When the media spotlight vanished from the camps, they were quickly handed over to the mega corporations and government economy management plans. Soon after, these camps started suffering from overcrowding, bad sanitation, and poor medical care. They were little better than gulags isolated from the rest of the world. In a twisted sort of way, their internment helped protect native populations from the ravages of the VTOS outbreaks that killed off swaths of the world's population throughout 2000 and much of the next year. Everything changed on December 24, 2011 as magic returned to the world. Though it was a shock to many, some saw it coming and prepared. Among these was a man named Daniel Coleman, a 20-year-old youth prisoner held at the Abilene Re-Education Compound, who on December 24, 2011, at the same exact time as passengers on a bullet train in Japan saw the great dragon Ryumu, Daniel Coleman and the prisoners of the Abilene Re-Education Compound walked out of the camp to their freedom. It was uncanny, they just ignored us. But it was like they never heard a word we said. I thought it might have been the thunder that was drowning out the loudspeakers. My boss, he didn't agree. He decided to make good on his threat to fire if they didn't stop. I was scared, what with the spooky way the natives were acting. When the others started firing, I did too. But the natives just kept walking and that Daniel Coleman was kinda like glowing. I know the scientists say it was just a trick of the light, some kind of reflection from the light. I still swear I hit him clean two or three times, but he kept walking. When they got to the gate, which the wind had blown open, they just waltzed right out of there. We didn't go after him that night because of the storm. Next morning, we couldn't find a trace. It was weird. Hey man, are you hungry? Yeah, but we'll be going to find something to eat so early in the mornings. Skip the shacks. Shack. That's right, Stuffer Shack, best place to stuff your shack, open 24-7 and located on any street corner where extra legal activity is found. As technologies and subsidiaries cannot be held legally responsible for any accidental death or explosive diarrhea while patroning Stuffer Shack. After his escape, Daniel Coleman vanished from the public eye. It is now known that he and his followers spent the next few years organizing a resistance movement. While the powers of North America were denying magic's return, Coleman was teaching the newly awakened how to weaponize it. Quickly word of the shaman spread, fueling the fires of resistance as more natives escaped from the re-education camps. Daniel Coleman did not return to the public eye until 2014. Now calling himself Howling Coyote, he announced the formation of the Native American Nations, a new coalition of native peoples. In this announcement, Coleman declared that the NAN laid claim to all of North America as theirs by right and demanded the withdrawal of all peoples of European, Asian, and African descent from the continent, or they would be met with magical retribution. These demands were met with ridicule in the media by corporal propagandists as the North American powers and the megacorps both looked at these threats as laughable, as at this time the powers that be were still busy trying to explain away the awakening with science. But they all stopped laughing when Redondo Peak erupted, burying the town of Los Alamos in a cloud of burning ash. Soon after the eruption, Helen Coyote appeared via vidcast from a nearby Zuni reservation. In this video, he took credit for the destruction of Los Alamos. Los Alamos was more than just a warning from the NAN or a display of their military capabilities. It was a military target home to the Los Alamos National Laboratory, whose main responsibility it was to ensure the security of the United States through nuclear deterrence. With the destruction of Los Alamos, the United States lost many of their leading mines in nuclear weapon development. Mines now needed as the U.S. and Canada 
have found themselves facing the weaponized magic of the NAND. In response, the United States dispatched the 6th Air Cavalry out of Port Hood, Texas. They were tasked with bringing in the self-proclaimed shaman Howling Coyote so he could answer for the destruction of Los Alamos. However, on their way to the Zuni Reservation, U.S. forces encountered out of nowhere a powerful storm, which caused multiple tornadoes that gripped their aircraft from the sky, preventing the 6th Cav from ever reaching the Zuni Reservation. By the time a second force could be dispatched, Howling Coyote and his followers were long gone. Thus, the Great Ghost Ants War began, and no longer did anyone laugh at the threats of the NAN. Even as the Megacorps joined U.S. and Canadian forces in the war, there was little they could do to stop the NAN fighters, as they fought a guerrilla war through towns and countryside now depopulated by the first VTOS outbreak. It should be noted here the impact VTOS and the rise of the Megacorps had on the war. All native populations were mostly spared from the VTOS outbreak as their captors isolated them in concentration camps, the North American powers were severely weakened. No longer were these nations the powerhouses of the 20th century as the VTOS outbreak weakened their manpower and the megacorporations greedily picked away at their economic and political influence for their own gain. As fighting broke out, Denver quickly became a major focal point of the war as both sides saw the strategic value of the city, both as a transportation hub and for its military infrastructure. The city not only became a center for fighting, but also an ignored humanitarian crisis as both sides cut Denver off from civilian supply lines. While combatants focused mainly on supplying their own forces, the people of Denver faced food shortages, riots, and a complete breakdown of medical care. In the last nine days of the war, the shortages were at their worst, as nothing moved into the city, which caused many to do unspeakable acts to survive. As war spread all over the continent, the NAN found an unexpected ally in the nation of Mexico, who had just recently gone through their own cultural revolution against colonialism, even going as far as renaming their nation Aslan as a means of embracing their indigenous identity. With claims of ideological similarities and the backing of Oro Corporation, Aslan began supporting NAND forces in the name of anti-colonialism. Aslan freely gave aid in the form of weapons, money, equipment, and safe haven from corporate and government forces, but fell short of any actual military action on their part. Many on both sides of the war have criticized the involvement of Aslan, stating they were merely playing political games with a hungry eye on Texas, hoping to one day regain the former Mexican territory with the support of the NAND after the war, or failing that, move in with troops after the region had destabilized as he did in 2035. In this backdrop of total war, the newly elected president, William Springer, enacted Executive Order 321, which was ratified by Congress in the Resolution Act of 2016. This law was nothing more than a way of legalizing genocide, legislation that minced no words as it mandated the extermination of all Amerindians in North America. Though in Canada there was no corresponding law, they did however give the nod to the megacorps to deal with natives as they saw fit. The idea was that in the end they could claim no actual legislation of genocide on their part. By 2017, the joint North American and corporate forces had planned what is now known as a genocide campaign. As these powers gathered in preparation for the campaign, NAND forces were busy delaying and harrying their logistics with both mundane and magical means. These ambushes, storms, and uncanny events had hindered troop movements and supply lines throughout North America. During all this, the awakened men and women of the NAND, led by Howling Coyote himself, started a powerful ritual that he had taught them in his years while he spent in hiding, the Great Ghost Dance. All across the continent, they focused their newfound magic into one spell so powerful that many died from its casting. At 10.30 a.m. August 17th, 2017, the genocide campaign began, and at 10.32 a.m. of the same day, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Adams all erupted with devastating fury. This caused the joint forces of the North American powers to a grinding halt as they realized Howling Coyote and the NAN had made good on their threats of magical reprisal with the equivalent of a magical nuclear bomb. As one reporter put it, Mother Earth let us know whose side they were on, and it wasn't ours. Due to the shocking defeat of the genocide campaign and fear of further magical reprisal, many took to the streets in protest of the war. In these protests, many of the now undermanned military installations were taken over by Amerindians and non-native sympathizers demanding a multinational peace conference be held. Due to military losses and the political pressure caused by public fear and protest, the North American governments and the megacorps had to admit defeat and grudgingly agree to meet with the NAND in Denver for a peace conference. 
By November 2017, the U.S. and Canada had started negotiations with a man leadership known as the Sovereign Tribal Council led by Howling Coyote. Also in attendance was the nation of Aslan, who had gained a seat on the Sovereign Tribal Council through their support of NAN forces during the war. After three long months of hard negotiation, all powers in attendance walked away with a treaty no one liked. In this treaty, the U.S. and Canada recognized the sovereignty of the Native American nations and ceded the western half of North America, with the exception of most of California and a few extraterritorial enclaves like Seattle. They also agreed that there would be a 10-year population relocation plan where reservations would be put into place for non-Native peoples and corporations wishing to remain in Nan territory. The city of Denver would be set aside as a neutral city governed by a council of five signatory nations with interest in the region. These nations were the United States, Aslan, Ute, Sioux, and the Pueblo Council. Denver became a place where the treaty could be overseen on neutral ground by all the new and old powers of North America. Though no one was happy with the treaty, the conference still stands as one of the best examples in history for political compromise. I heard the words of the prophet around a fire three years ago. He was a strong man, powerful in body and spirit and I was afraid of him. His words were strong too. He spoke of a new ghost dance, a great ghost dance. This time, he said, the magic would work. Unlike the ghost dance our ancestors performed, this one would shatter the yoke of our oppressors. He told us that the old prophets were right, though their vision had been clouded and they had not seen the time for the dance. The world was not yet ready then, but now the time had come. His eyes were bright when he spoke these words, and I believed him. In the morning he was gone from our hidden camp, but he remained in our hearts. Have you heard of Ares, the god of war? You know a predator, mundane or awaken? Have you ever wondered what would happen if you combined the two? Well, we did. And with highly strategic research and blasting, we resulted in the Ares predator. Chaos can be controlled with Ares. The newly founded Native American nations had just won a war and signed the Treaty of Denver, which forced the United States and Canada to formally recognize the NAN as a nation while ceding the western half of North America to the NAN. But now with the war won, the question on everyone's mind was could the Native American nations now win the peace? One of the earliest hurdles for the NAN was international recognition, as many countries outside of North America were slow in recognizing the Native American nations. Most did not want to get on the bad side of the United States, but they also did not want to burn their bridges with this new nation who just defeated a superpower. So most of the countries of the world adopted a wait-and-see approach as Anand settled in. After the Treaty of Denver, Howland Coyote was unanimously elected the head of the new Sovereign Tribal Council, the governing body of the Native American nations, based in Cheyenne. This body is comprised of counselors from each of the member states, which also included Aslan at the time due to their support in the war. These counselors are powerful and connected figures in their own right, and hold great influence even beyond their own member state. This council was designed off the same model used by the European Union of the late 20th century. A sovereign tribal council would mediate between member states, conduct foreign diplomacy while running the banking reserve. And in times of war, the sovereign tribal council would be tasked with organizing joint military operations, but each member state would be free to conduct their own internal business and trade as it saw fit. It was almost immediately that the cracks began to appear within the Sovereign Tribal Council as bickering over what lands, resources, and infrastructure would be controlled by which member state. These tensions only grew as the U.S. worked hard to fan the flames of infighting among the members of the NAD, who now that the war was won saw themselves more as independent nations than a greater union. Throughout this rough time, the NAN was only held together through the strong leadership of Howling Coyote, who once said, It is one thing to pull together in the face of a common enemy. It is another for once nominally independent nations to continue working closely when self-sufficiency is near. During these intense negotiations, the city of Denver became a hotly contested region by all treaty signers who had a claim in the region, and even a few who did not. Being the treaty city, Denver became a microcosm of the larger issues of geopolitical policies and land and resource division of North America. After long sessions of diplomacy, the Denver area became the front-range free zone, a region open in theory to all signers of the Treaty of Denver as a place to administer the treaty and engage in peaceful diplomacy. After the Treaty of Denver, the Front Range Free Zone was jointly administered by those nations who had signed the Treaty of Denver and had influence in the region. Over time, due to political tensions, Denver became a segregated city with its neighborhoods walled off along political lines, 
much like the city of Berlin during the Cold War. For those who run in the shadows, Denver is a runner's paradise, as these powers often work against each other in secret. With the groundwork of the NAN laid and the borders drawn, it came time to decide how to implement the 10-year relocation plan of non-native residents. Under the Treaty of Denver, those who could not prove Amerindian descent would have to either relocate to the U.S. and Canada, or live in one of the newly set up reservations for non-Amerindians. To the annoyance of some member states of the NAN, these reservations are still around today, acting as independent enclaves within NAN territory. Many runners use these as safe havens to hide from local authorities. One very hot topic along these lines that caused a lot of debate during this early period was the issue of non-voting residency for non-Amerindians. At first, work visas were allowed for people who wished to stay and had skills needed by the NAN to keep things running. As the U.S. and Canada abruptly pulled their staff off important infrastructure like the power grid and waterworks, the Shimshim Nation was the leader of opposition against these policies which would cause many problems for the man in the years to come. These tensions became even more heated as UGE ravaged the world and the flames of metahuman bigotry caused many nations to close their borders as they pursued policies of discrimination against their fellow metahuman. But in the NAN, it was Howling Coyote himself who pushed hard to allow metahumans facing persecution a safe haven within the Native American nations. This was done as many other nations were closing their borders in fear of UGE. Many, both within and outside the NAN, have criticized this as more than just a moral decision defending metahuman rights, but as a means of kickstarting economies in regions like Oregon who were depopulated due to VITAS and the Relocation Act. Despite the anger and infighting this caused, after much discussion, the Sovereign Tribal Council agreed to Howling Coyote's plan, and many metahumans were allowed to form communities within the Native American nations, sparing many from the horrors leading up to the Night of Rage. The Salish Sea Council was one of the Nan states who embraced this new policy of metahuman immigration, founding many metahuman communities within their borders, such as the Cascade Orc in the Cascade Mountains and the Elves of Oregon. Despite these successes, by 2034, things were at their worst as infighting and self-interest reigned in the Sovereign Tribal Council. By this time, Aslan was facing voting blocks against them in both the Sovereign Tribal Council and in Denver by their own NAN allies. Aslan, seeing that they would not have the influence they wanted in the Sovereign Tribal Council, and realizing that the NAN would not support their planned invasion of Texas, Aslan left the NAN, citing infighting as the reason. After their departure, the Native American nations accused Aslan of mistreatment of Native peoples within their borders, but by 2035, Aslan forces were invading Texas and no one cared anymore. Meanwhile in Oregon, as much of the Native population was moving north to the Puget Sound area, that was fast becoming the political and cultural center for the Salish Sea Council. Those were being encouraged to immigrate to Oregon by the very influential Salish Sea Council member, Walter Brightwater. These new immigrants were quick to rebuild the degraded and abandoned infrastructure of the region, and as more and more elves quietly moved in, they succeeded in making a state within a state. It was in 2035 these elves declared themselves Tir Tangier, a new and independent nation from the Nan. The Salish Sea Council were fast to respond, and soon their troops were fighting skirmishes across the Columbia River. But in the end, the Salish Sea Council lost the war and all their Oregon territory. Sadly, many NAN member states saw the loss of the Salish Sea as a means of gaining influence on the Sovereign Tribal Council and were quick to recognize Tir Tangier. But for one member of the NAN, this was a step too far. With the relations between the Shimshian Nation and the Sovereign Tribal Council already souring over environmental laws, immigration policies for non-native metahumans, and even immigration of other Amerindians into their land, the Shimshian Nation followed the lead of Tir Tangier and declared their secession from the NAN in 2037, after the Sovereign Tribal Council had censored them for the violent repression of minority Amerindian groups within their borders. By 2038, most of the international community thought the Native American nations were close to collapse as the Pueblo Corporate Council and the Ute Nation began to fight skirmishes along their disputed border. It was in this turmoil that the one man who had spent decades fighting for his people and saved them from genocide, the one man who had kept them together through bickering and founded a nation, woke up one day and just walked away from it all. Some say Howling Coyote felt the Nan needed to survive without him, while others have said he saw the futility of his role and at last had enough of the infighting and petty disputes of the Sovereign Tribal Council. Whatever the reason was, Howling Coyote, the father of the Native American nations and the prophet of the Great Ghost Dance, disappeared from society. 
Many today still debate where he went, and there have been many sightings of him being reported to this day, claiming that he is leading raids over the border into the UCAS or living in a top secret compound teaching the ways of magic somewhere in the Rockies, while others have claimed that they have seen him living homeless in the streets of Denver's Ute sector. Whatever the truth is of where he went, the shock of his leaving soon snapped the Sovereign Tribal Council out of their selfish delusions causing their infighting to slowly quiet to a dull background noise. As each NAN member state realized the benefit that a united front had when dealing with foreign powers, and that now that Howling Coyote was gone, it was up to them alone to keep the NAN together, or they would soon lose their place on the international stage in everything they had fought for. Despite its long history of internal discord and the many flaws of the Sovereign Tribal Council, it is a powerful tool for the NAN member states both as a means of promoting their own interests and agendas within the NAN, but also as a way of remaining an influential player on the international stage. Currently, the Sovereign Tribal Council is based in Cheyenne and meets for one week every month to discuss issues related to the NAN and the Sovereign Tribal Council as a whole. They also hold a yearly summit between NAN member states. This summit is hosted by a new member every year, and this mega event is a great privilege to host as it can bring much political influence to the one hosting it. Even though the NAN has had a rocky start and has had many flaws in the past, they have remained a major power in North America. With international recognition by most world powers, the NAN has earned legitimacy on the world stage equal to that of those they fought in the past, proving they can withstand whatever the six worlds can throw at them and not only survive, but thrive. We're not like those out in the Salish Shi, those dreamers who can't see that life in this world means life in the city. Natives have to take to the concrete the way they took to the horse, or we're going to all pass away from this land entirely. Since the Anglos came, some of us have fought them, some of us have welcomed them. It didn't make much difference in the end. We lost control of the land, and it ended in misery, despair, and poverty. Then they threw us in the camps, where they tried to strip away our souls. When Helen Coyote came down from the hills with a great ghost dance, he sure did hand the Anglos a surprise. It made the man realize that the natives weren't going to take it anymore. Broke their technology with this magic he did, but that was then and the Anglos have magic now too, but some of my people don't want to face it. The old men who led the dance don't understand what it did for us. It didn't banish the Anglos as advertised. They're still here, and so are their cities and their works, weakened maybe and shushed back by magic and the power of the awakened, but far from beaten. What the dance really did was give us breathing room, and it gave us a chance to beat the others at their own game. It ain't gonna be easy. It's gonna take real warriorship, but my people are ready for that challenge. We'll show them. In the end, we'll win. But to win, we're gonna have to survive. And surviving means Nuyen. You ain't got script, the man don't listen. There's a lot of loose creds waiting around for Shadowrunners to liberate. Why am I talking to you? Are you ready for the sacrifice? Why? No! I guess so! I mean, maybe? I mean, sure, why not? That's right. Sacrifice your hunger at Taco Temple today with our squeezable salad, our fireball burrito, and our really big drink. As Technologies and subsidiary Taco Temple deny any responsibility for lack of satisfaction in food, explosive diarrhea, or disappointment in visiting Taco Temple. Live from Prince Edward's Island, it's Worm Talk, starring your host, Dokulzan, the dragon, telling you all you need to know about the sixth age. With your guests, Charles Nelson Riley, Bo Derrick, Pete Fountain, Mickey Zephyrin, and from the zoo, Joan Embry. And now for your host, Dunkelzon!